Here we have an A1707 MacBook Pro that's not turning on. Let's open this machine up and see if we can figure out why it's not turning on and make it work again. Make it into a happy little touch bar, if such a thing even exists. All right, so as always, the first thing that we typically like to do here is see how much power the board is taking without the battery. So I'm just going to unplug the battery so that on my USB-C amp meter I can see how much power the board is drawing. <laughs> how many amps does this take? All right, we're taking 280 milliamps. And it appears that we're stuck at 5.12 volts and not moving from there. Let's try and figure out why we're stuck at 5.12 volts and not moving. So we're going to take all the screws out of this machine. There's a lot of different T3 and T5 screws, all of different sizes, of course. This is a MacBook inside the machine. We're just going to unscrew every single one of them. Looks like we have 43 people watching, even though there's typically two to 500, maybe sometimes 700 watching this stream. So just a big shout out to YouTube for not giving people notifications. Paul is actually unable to get to the stream, even if he clicks onto the channel. The greatness of YouTube. Okay, so we are going to take all the screws out of this machine. And we're going to make this thing work. It's going to work great, beautifully. Once we're done, and hopefully I can show you what it is I did, why I did it, and you can understand so that you could take one of these machines and make them work again too. With the way Apple tells people you got to spend fourteen to $1,500 to fix it, there's a lot of these that are probably just getting disposed of or tossed out. And the real gold mine with these is not even the stuff that's been recycled. It's, been, it's the stuff that's just sitting in someone's night table drawer next to their bed, under their bed, because they just don't know what to do with it. They don't have the money to spend on fixing it based on the price that they think it's going to cost. There's an untapped market there. Just tens of thousands of these machines that are probably sitting dead for silly reasons. And if you can figure out how to make them work again, and you can find where they are, then you can make a little bit of extra money for yourself. While also making an owner very happy. You're not just a teacher, you're also an entertainer. Do the GoFundMe and let us enjoy better content. Thank you very much, Hazim. Okay, so the issue that we have with this machine is that it's stuck at 5.2 volts. Why is it stuck at 5.2 volts and only taking 200 milliamps? It's supposed to be giving us 20 volts and 1.5 amps. But as you can see, it's stuck at 5.12 volts, 2080 milliamps. Now, the first thing that we got to do is see if PP33 underscore G3 hot is present. If PP33 underscore G3 hot is present, CD3215s won't turn on. If CD3215s don't turn on, it means that the charger is not going to go up to 20 volts and it's going to stay at 5 volts, thinking it's a GoPro or a cell phone. So the first thing we got to do here is see if we're getting our rail of PP3V3 underscore G3 hot. 1.7. One point eight. Interesting. Hmm. So PP33 underscore G3 hot is trying to enable itself, but it's failing to go all the way up. Partial short on PP33 underscore G3 hot, perhaps? One way to find out. Let's see if the enable is there. We're going to take the schematic in the board view to an 820-00281 and check it out. See what we get. So that is the enable signal for PP3v3 underscore G3 hot. Let's just make sure it's being enabled. It probably is. It's just being partially shorted to ground. You put the ball in the pocket or else it gets the hose again. Five volts. Enable is present. Only getting 1.8 volts over there. Hmm. Let's see what our resistance to ground is on that rail. Let's see why we're only getting 1.8 instead of 3.3. 160 ohms. That's not right. We have a short circuit, ladies and gentlemen. Have you ever had 160 ohms to ground on PP3v3, Paul? Pretty free now. All right, let's take a look around the board and see if anything looks nasty. It looks dusty. It's always possible the dust is covering corrosion. There's so much dust. Absolutely filthy. Put the ball in the pocket. Now, 160 ohms wouldn't be that terrible if it was a high voltage, like 12 or 8. But being that it's a low voltage, like 3, it's going to be hard to see anything if it is shorted. All right, so let's take a look at some Ohm's Law calculators. So if we have... Let's see, 3.3 volts at 160 ohms. 160 ohms, that, that would take 0 0.06 watts. I'm never going to see that. 
So injecting voltage to find the short is barely an option here. Because while that is a short circuit, it's not going to be out putting out enough that I'm going to be able to visually see it. Whoa, one amp. How is it taking one amp? It said 160 ohms at three volts. Ohm's law calculator said, according to Mr. Ohm, sly and sack of shit, he said that it's going to be taking point, it's going to be taking 0 0.02 amps. But when I do this, an amp. Whoa. What kind of Ohm's law did you use? 3.3 3 volts at 160 ohms. Ohm is, ohm is a lion sack of crap. What is it? What are you looking for? Okay, it's 3.3 3 volts at 160 ohms. How many watts or amps is the short going to pull? Okay, so something on this board is going to be taking... Ow. Yeah, I, just, I saw the dust start to leave one of the chips. So what is taking an amp here? Now, also, for, for one of the things I want you to get is, do you understand why it is that I am looking for PP3V3 underscore G3 hot? So I'm not getting 20 volts in the charger. The charger is only putting out 5 volts. My USB-C amp meter that I put between the charger and the machine is what is telling me that it's stuck at 5 volts. Now, as to why it is that that matters, why is, it, why is PP3V3 underscore G3 hot matter there? Let's go to the chip that's going to do the actual communication with the with the charger. So that's going to be the CD3215. There's one CD3215. It's a USB-C port controller, as you can read over here. And there's one of them per port. Now, if you check out over here, you'll see it's this chip gets its power, V in, voltage in, from PP3V3 underscore G3 hot. So I went to check that rail, and when I checked the rail, that's when I noticed that it was 1.8 volts rather than 3.3 volts. Now, as it says in that little instruction manual I post in the bottom of all my videos, when you're not missing a power rail, is it being enabled? We have 5 volts at the enable. Check. Is uh, the chip bad? It's always possible, but not sure yet. Is it being shorted to ground? Let's see that, because it's easier to see if it's shorted to ground than it is to try another chip. We did, and we saw it's 160 ohms, which means something on the line has to be shorted. So what I decided to do, the way a short to ground works, short to ground, when they say oh, what it, something is short, rather than the electricity making its way all the way around the circuit, is that one of the things that's connected to ground shorts. So instead of it making all the way over here, something is connecting to ground more than it should. So instead of the power making its way all the way through the circuit, this one thing shoves it all to ground. Now, electricity and is essentially energy. Energy is heat. So if what I could do here is I could take 3.3 .3 volts from my power supply, something much stronger than that little sissy chip on the board, you know, th this thing over here. What do you think is more powerful? This power supply that I have over here? This thing that weighs you know, like 10 pounds? Or that teeny tiny little sissy chip on the board? Obviously, it's going to be the power supply. So I tell the power supply to put 3.3 .3 volts into the rail. I attach the grounds of the power supply to the grounds of the board. And whatever it is on the board that is sh causing my short circuit is going to get really hot. Because remember, electricity is energy. Energy is heat. So then I use the heat to figure out what the problem is. This is actually how I met Jessa Jones at CTIA. We were the two people there that both used our face to find shorts in the board. We were the only two in the room that were doing that. And that's how we started a friendship. Now... While uh, Paul was up there, I noticed that on this very disgusting, filthy board that one of these chips actually had the dust start leaving it. And I'm going to show you which one that is. So today, just in case you don't have a high-end thermal camera, because I'm constantly showing you how this works on a high-end thermal cam, we're going to show you how to find the short using something that's really cheap. Liquid. Like alcohol. All right, so what we're going to do here is we're going to turn the power supply off. Enjoy listening to you speak at Right to Repair. Hearing intelligence is amazing. Thank you very much how you remind me but no thank you for getting that song stuck back in my head that's evil so i'm going to turn off the power supply for a second and i think it was right over here so now what we do is we put the alcohol over the chips and put the light all the way up and you should be able to see when i turn it on which chip it is and it's the one on the left you see how the alcohol is evaporating from the chip on the left far more than the chip on the right the next w thing that we're going to do here to see if that's the thing that's wrong is we're going to take Steve's finger and we're going to put it on the chip. Hey. Touch the chip. So it looks like our CD3215 is what's wrong. And oh my God, look at that. There's some green dust right there. So you see how the pubic hairs in this area have little bits of green by them? Those little bits of green are likely corrosion. So maybe some water or humidity made its way in there. See those green pubes? 
All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to replace that CD3215. If you need a CD3215, by the way, if anybody was curious as to where it is, they could get a CD3215 while I ready the board for one. Get wrecked, Adblock. This video is brought to you by our sponsors at store.rossmangroup.com. Thank you for supporting our sponsors that help keep us in business. On store.rossmangroup.com, you can find chips, supplies, ultrasonics, flux, soldering stations, and more. With 4.9 stars on Shopper approved, same-day shipping from New York City, and free continental shipping over $30, you can't lose. We even offer free support, unless you're a please bro, live chat, and are adding new products every day. If you buy today, we'll throw in a special offer that your order will actually go through properly. What are you waiting for? Go to store.rossmangroup.com to get yourself some authentic Amtec Flux. Don't delay. Buy today. And put a little bit of Amtec Flux. Remember, just enough. Now, before we do something stupid, we're gonna see if the short is gone. 15 kilo ohms. That's much better than what we had before, which was 160 ohms. Then again, just as I just said, there's no reason to trust Mr. Ohm. Mr. Ohm did us dirty. There's no rhyme or reason for why Mr. Ohm did us so dirty. It's supposed to take 0 0.02 or 6 watts or amps, and the thing is taking way more. Don't make a damn bit of sense. Paul even double-checked my math. Did you ever expect Ohm to let you down like that, Paul? Never. You had the, you had the wrong reading. That's the user error. I like my meter. It never gets anything wrong. You can't repeal Ohm's law. I have repealed Ohm's law. You cannot repeal Ohm's law. Is Unalienable right. Ohm is dead. Maybe that could be the merch that we get. A set of multimeters that use like Paul's Law or something. <laughs> Number one, if you use a Q-tip instead of a clean room thingy, th th you turn it around over and over rather than back and forth. This way, if any of the hairs come off, they still wind up getting wrapped around the Q-tip. Put a little bit of flux. This is the right amount of flux. I'm not using more flux than I should because my store, my online store that sells flux is going to help fund the new store location we're moving to. I would never do something like that. We're using the right amount of flux. Paul is getting with the program. Paul understands that a proper desk an even floor, I want light, light, fixtures. light fixtures that allow you to see things properly, but you know, a floor that's actually true level, as Rick and Morty would say. Wow, it's so, oh, 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 oh my god, oh Christ. Uh, yeah, oh, true ooh, level, uh, bitch. Uh, Morty, come on, we're leaving for school. Oh, oh, everything's crooked, reality is poison, I, I want to go back, I hate this. What's his deal? <laughs> Can't fund that if we're selling honest amounts of flux. But you gotta sell an Adam Newman amount of flux. Oh yeah, look at that. Look at that chip, Paul. <laughs> that chip is stacked as high as WeWork's debt. Are you invested in SoftBank, Paul? Nope. It's good to know that some people make even stupider investments than I did. I never bought into the WeWork thing. 
I was meeting people in the park in 2009 and 10, in Herald Square, or I would just travel to them. Like, there's no point in paying two to seven hundred bucks for a desk when I have no dignity and I'm sharing the space with hundreds upon hundreds of people. Like, at that point, I, I'm better, I'm literally better off just having a table at a park. Thirty milliamps is being used when I inject 3.3 into the board. That's a good thing. Our short is gone. Now I'm going to just desolder that wire that I put on the PP3V3 creation point. And we're going to see if this works before Paul ultrasonic something. Paul is a selfish bastard. He wants to do his job. But if he uses the ultrasonic cleaner, it screws up my microphone. One of millions of problems that will be solved if I get a new location. Why can't we put the ultrasonic on? Yeah, good times. All right, let's see what happens here. Do you turn on or do you go to Paul? All right, so the boot sequence is proper using 20 milliamps on five volts, then 20 volts at 1.22 amps. See that? That's a proper looking boot sequence there. See? Let's just plug it in the other port. This is what happens when I can't ultrasonic something. So that is the proper boot sequence. There we go. We fixed our problem. We had a short circuit to ground and the power will require for powering the CD3215. That's going to talk to the charger and tell the charger to put out 20 volts instead of 5. We cleared our short circuit. We found our short circuit by checking for the... So it looks like we had a short circuit to ground on PP33 underscore G3 hot. That's the power rail that's required for the CD3215 to speak to the charger. The CD3215 is the chip that is called a USB-C port controller, and the charger is not going to be at 20 volts. It's going to be at 5 volts until it speaks to the computer and realizes that it's a MacBook and not a GoPro. It would suck if a USB-C charger decided to send 20 volts to your phone or 20 volts to a GoPro. So there needs to be that basic communication first, and that communication is not going to happen if the CD3215 is not powering on. The CD3215 is not powering on because PP33 underscore G3 hot was missing. These PP33 underscore G3 hot is the primary power rail responsible for powering the CD3215s. Now, when we went to take a look at the PP33 underscore G3 hot rail, the enable signal was present on pin 10. We were getting 5.1 volts there from the ISL 9239. However, we were only getting 1.8 volts in output. When we were to check to see what the impedance to ground was in output, we were getting 160 ohms, which it does mean a short to ground. So what we decided to do is inject 3.3 volts from an external power supply into the board. And when we did so, we noticed that there was one CD3215 that was getting hot. That's going to be the CD3215 that's sending all the energy to ground. That's going to be the CD3215 that is internally damaged and shorting PP3 underscore G3 hot. When we replaced that chip with a new chip from store.rossmangroup.com, the board did turn on, take 20 volts, and work as intended. Hopefully this video is educated. Hopefully you learn something from it. Hopefully you'll be able to take one of these machines that Apple says, sorry, you have to pay us $1,500 or whatever for another one and fix it for the customer or for yourself. Save yourself some money. Keep the machine from going into a landfill. And above all, feel that nice, happy little piece of dopamine rush to go through your head when you make something work again and you see the fan spin on something somebody else told you you couldn't fix. It's an amazing feeling. And 11 years in, it just it doesn't get old. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something.